So we've now come across the exponential of a matrix, which we define to be the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of 1 over n factorial a to the n, where a to the 0 means the identity matrix. And I promised you I'd tell you why it is that this sum converges. But before I do that, I need to tell you what it means for a sum like this to converge, or more generally, for a sequence of matrices to converge. So, to a sequence A subscript K of matrices matrices converges to a matrix A if now the definition is going to look exactly like the definition of convergence you're used to for all epsilon positive there exists an N such that the size of a k minus a is less than epsilon whenever k is bigger than n. And the only difficulty is in understanding what is meant by the size of a matrix. So if this were just numbers, this would be the absolute value of a k minus a. But because we're working with matrices, absolute value doesn't make sense. We need to specify what this really means. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put double vertical bars on either side of AK minus A and I read that aloud as the norm of AK minus A. So norm can mean a couple of different things. Um, I'm going to define two matrix norms uh, in this video and prove some nice properties and how they're related. And then in the next video we'll use those to check this uh, convergence property. So a matrix norm is just any function that takes n by n matrices, let's say real n by n matrices, to numbers, real numbers, satisfying the following properties. So first of all, um, I should give it a name, I should, I'm going to call it vertical bars, two vertical bars on either side of something. That's how I will denote a matrix norm. So first of all, uh, it satisfies something called the triangle inequality. So the norm of A plus B should be bounded above by the norm of A plus the norm of B. Second, uh, if I take the norm of lambda A, where lambda is just a number, a scalar number, that gives me the same as absolute value of lambda times the norm of A. And three, uh, the norm of A is zero if and only if A itself is zero. So you can see this is something which is in some sense telling us the size of the matrix A. It's telling us how far away from the zero matrix A is. It gets bigger if we rescale our matrix by some big constant. And it satisfies the triangle inequality that, you know, for example, is satisfied by the Euclidean length in, in Rn. Um, so any function satisfying these three properties is, is a norm on matrices. Um, this is the kind of thing you'll come across if you do any course on normed spaces. Um, we're going to pick two particular norms. So the first one is called the L1 norm. Of a matrix A. And this is just defined to be, I'm going to write it in this way, A with double bars around and a subscript L upper one. This is just defined to be the sum over all the matrix entries AIJ of the absolute value of the matrix entry AIJ. Okay, so what kind of matrix is big in the L1 norm? Well, it's anything whose entries are big. Right, you just take the absolute values of the entries, you sum them, and that's your L1 norm. Clearly, if this vanishes, then all the entries have to be zero. So that satisfies this third axiom here. Again, clearly, if you multiply your matrix A by a number lambda, 
all the entries get multiplied by lambda. The absolute values of the entries get multiplied by absolute value lambda. So the, the normal rescale by absolute value lambda. So it satisfies the second property of being a norm. The third property is less obvious, but you can deduce it from the, the analogous property of the absolute value. So, you know, remember if, if you have numbers x and y, then the absolute value of x plus y is at most the absolute value of x plus the absolute value of y. This is the is it the Cauchy-Schwarz some some kind of inequality? It's triangle inequality anyway. Um, and by applying this entry by entry to the matrix, you see that the L1 norm satisfies this first condition as well. So it is a norm. That's one way of measuring the size of a matrix. But there's another way, which is less um, less less of a, an obvious thing to do. So this is called the operator norm. The operator norm of A is defined to be, I'm going to write it as A with doubled bar signs around it and then subscript op to distinguish it from the L1 norm. So this is a maximum over a certain set of numbers. So what are these numbers? Well, you take all the unit vectors in Rn. In other words, the vectors of length 1. So here I'm writing vertical bars around u to denote its Euclidean length in Rn. In other words, the sum of the squares of the components of u square rooted. So you take all the unit vectors and you apply a to them. And then you take the length of those and you look for the biggest length. Okay, so in other words, you're taking the unit sphere in Rn, maybe that's the unit circle in the plane or the unit sphere in R3. You apply your matrix to it and it becomes some kind of ellipse or ellipsoid. And you look to get as far away from the origin on that ellipsoid as you can. And that is defined to be the made the operator norm of A. So let's do a quick example. So here's the plane. Here's the unit circle in the plane. So this is the the vectors sitting on this circle are called u in this formula. Make it sit at the origin. Um, our map A, I'll, I don't know, I'll take something like uh, 1, 0, 0, 2. So what happens to the unit circle under this map? Well, the x-axis stays where it is. The y-axis gets rescaled by a factor of 2. So our unit circle ends up being rescaled. So it becomes an ellipse that's twice as high as it is wide. Like this. So, how far away can I get from the origin on this ellipse? Well, clearly the furthest point is at the north or south pole of the ellipse. And how far is it? Well, it's been rescaled by a factor of 2. So this distance is 2. So the matrix norm of A, or the oper oh, sorry, operator norm of A is 2. In this example. Okay, let's think. Is it a norm? Well, what what does it mean if this operator norm vanishes? It means that all points on the unit sphere get sent to something with length 0. The only thing that has length 0 is 0. So everything gets sent to the origin. So that definitely tells us that A would have to be the 0 matrix if the operator norm vanishes. If you rescale A by a constant, then certainly the lengths of a u all rescale by the same constant. So in particular the maximum of those lengths gets rescaled by this constant. And what about the triangle inequality? Well again it's a bit harder to see um, but it is true. Let's prove it. Uh, I'm going to need a, another page. So let's let's try and let's see what happens if we take um, the, the matrix A plus B and I apply it to a unit vector u. I take the length of that. What do I get? Well, 
um, it's the same as the length of AU plus BU, which now by the triangle inequality in RN for just the ordinary Euclidean length is less than or equal to the length of AU plus the length of BU. Here, remember, U is a unit vector, that's length one. And now looking at the definition of the operator norm, the biggest possible value of AU is the operator norm of A by definition. So this whole quantity is bounded above by the operator norm of A plus, again, the operator norm of B because BU is bounded in length by the operator norm of B. So all the things, so if we're trying to calculate the operator norm of A plus B, this is the maximum over all unit vectors of the length of A plus B times U. And we've just said that all those lengths are less than or equal to operator norm of A plus operator norm of B. So this whole thing has to be less than or equal to norm A plus norm B. So this proves the triangle inequality. Okay, so again, this is a norm. These are two norms, the L1 norm and the operator norm. So nice fact that I'm not going to prove. Any two norms on n by n matrices are what's called Lipschitz equivalent. What does this mean? Um, this means that if you take, uh, I'll just state it for the the um, the two norms we've met so far. This is saying that the operator norm of A is bounded above by some constant, let's say C one, times the L one norm of A. In other words, if you have a bound on the absolute value, the sum of the absolute values of the matrix entries, then somehow you can get a bound on the operator norm. And conversely, so it's bounded below it as well. So C2 times the A, uh, the L1 norm of A is a lower bound of A op for some constants C1 and C2. So C1, C2 don't depend on A. And conversely, well not conversely, but and the other way around as well. So there are constants D2 and D1 such that D2 times the operator norm of A is less than or equal to the L1 norm of A, which is less than or equal to D1 times the operator norm of A. So these inequalities here will be extremely useful uh, later on uh, in the proof. Um, sometimes it's easy to bound one of these norms and sometimes it's easy to bound the other and this is telling us if you can bound one norm you can bound the other one provided you add in some constant factor. In particular this is telling us that the notion of convergence that we defined up here for a sequence of matrices doesn't actually depend on which of the norms we picked. Because if a sequence converges for one set of matrices, then it converges, sorry, if, if a sequence converges for one of these norms, it also converges with respect to the other norm. Because these inequalities here, you can, uh, basically you get the same inequality, but with a constant here, and then just take epsilon to be even smaller. Um, so that's, that's the rough idea. So let me just write that. Um, so Lipschitz equivalent norms um, give the same notion of convergence. Okay, so the reason this lemma is true is because any two norms on a given finite dimensional vector space are Lipschitz equivalent. That's something you would see if you ever see a course on normed spaces. Um, if you look at more interesting vector spaces of operators on Hilbert spaces and, and things, um, then 
you get interesting different Lipschitz classes of, of uh, operators. So this is only because we're working with matrices that are sort of finite by finite matrices, n by n. Um, okay, so I'm not going to prove this. Uh, I'm just going to use these inequalities later on as and when I need them. Okay, last thing I want to do um, before moving on to the proof of convergence of x is to prove some nice properties of this operator norm because um, yeah it's a very nice nice norm it has some really, really good properties that'll be really useful for us so here's a lemma that I will prove first of all for any vector in Rn um, the length of a v is bounded above by the operator norm of a times the length of v Okay, so this is certainly true by definition if V is a unit vector. If V is not a unit vector, then um, this is something we'll prove. Next, um, if I take the product of two matrices and I take the operator norm of that product, that's bounded above by the product of the operator norms of the two matrices separately. So norm of AB equals norm of A times norm, sorry, it's less than or equal to norm of a times norm of b this is we're doing analysis here so that everything's inequalities and finally um, the operator norm of a to the n or maybe I should so n here is the dimension maybe I should call this a to the m is less than or equal to operator norm of a to the m okay three nice properties let's prove them So for A, uh, we're going to write the vector V as length of V times U for some unit vector U. So if V is 0, then this is just 0 times anything. Um, if V is not 0, you can rescale it until it has unit length. Take that to be U, and then the scale factor is exactly the length of V. Um, then the length of a v is the length of a times sorry is the length of a applied to length of v times u just substituting v by this expression length of v times u length of v is a scalar we can take it out the front this is uh, without changing anything we just get uh, length of V times the length of AU and the length of AU is bounded above by the operator norm of A by definition so this whole thing is bounded by norm of A times length of V this is just because in the definition of operator norm we took the maximum possible value of length AU over all U's so that's this term is certainly bounded above by this term Okay, and that's what we're trying to prove. So we get length of AV is less than or equal to norm A times length V. For part B, uh, if I want to find the operator norm of AB, I need to apply AB to a unit vector U and bound that from above. So what I get by the part A of the lemma is that this is a bounded above by norm A times the length of BV. And again, applying part A of the lemma to the length of BV, I get this is bounded above by length of A, sorry, norm of A times norm of B times the length of V. Sorry, V is, uh, v, U and V are changing names, aren't they? This is a U, not a V. It's a unit vector. And because it's a unit vector, the length of U is 1. So this expression here is just norm A times norm B. So the quantity we're maximizing to find the norm of AB is bounded above by norm A, norm B. So this tells us that norm AB is less than norm A, norm B. Okay, last of all, norm of A to the M is, well, 
using the previous part of the lemma we can just split off a factor of a and we get this is norm of a to the m minus 1 times sorry less than or equal to norm of a to the m minus 1 times norm of a and then we can keep going and in the end it splits into uh, norm of a to the power m but at every stage we're introducing inequalities so we just end up with an inequality okay so that proves this lemma these nice properties of the operator norm so in the next video we'll do what I keep promising we're going to do which is to prove that this se uh, sequence of uh, or this this infinite sum converges with respect to either of these norms and remember by this observation here the fact that the norms are Lipschitz equivalent it doesn't matter which one we use